Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! now and and this is quite an interesting one isn't it because the, the, the idea as I think the last two hours have proved that that equality is everyone agrees equality is desirable that that's something else that appears to be withering on the vine at the moment same with um, freedom of expression uh, you, you, most people who argue for freedom of expression are desperate to sh shut down other people's freedom of expression and freedom of religion is a crucial part of freedom of expression and you shouldn't really mock they often tell us other people's religions that's something I passionately disagree with uh, I think the uh, you, I arrived at boarding school in the early 1980s and life of Brian was still banned so the idea that the religions couldn't some, so somehow absorb mockery, probably more pertinent today to, to Islam, one of the surest ways I'd have thought to undermine the fundamentalists' worldview is to take the mickey out of the entry level, religiosity or, or religion. Um, but this prompts me to giggle at my own religion, this. It's a story about exorcism, and, and yet... This shows how much cognitive dissonance there is in most honest people's relationship with religion. You can sit, I can sit in church and say a prayer. Um, usually I say a prayer for all the people we were talking about in the last two hours, people whose lives are devoid of love and full of hate, because, you know, it's, someone has to even light the odd candle for them. So you sit in church and say a prayer, and somewhere in your mind, regardless of how devout you are, but somewhere in your mind, there's a notion that somebody's listening, right? And... Christian doctrine teaches you that, that there's a yang to that yin. God exists, but so does Satan. So does the devil. And, I mean, crikey, I, I don't think I've really bought into the idea that the devil exists since watching a Dennis Wheatley film in about 1984, The Devil Rides Out. I think it's Peter Cushing and his eyes appear in the rear view mirror of the girl's car even though he's not in the car. It's absolutely blinking terrifying. I slept with a crucifix under my pillow that night. So far, but I was 12. And yet, you can't really have one without the other. I mean, even the most cursory reading of scripture, even the most cursory reading of Christian doctrine makes the existence of the devil and demons, plural, absolutely clear. Jesus cast them out, didn't he? You, you, you know, it was, it was one of the miracles, more than one miracle that he performed. A reverend, a man of God, he is also... Say, I go! No, don't say I stay, I go! An exorcist. I stay! Say, we the people of God agree. We the people of God agree! Reverend Larson says this young man, Esau, is possessed with a demon. Another exorcism. Larson says Noella is also possessed by the devil. And he says her demons change her voice. Go now. Go where? Go now. Go now! Nobody is taking me out of this home. You may not believe in exorcism. Say, I Lucifer. Say, I Lucifer. Say, I Lucifer. But the practice is prevalent among many religions including Bob Larson's Evangelical Christianity. In simple terms, an exorcism is the process of expelling an evil spirit from an individual who has become somehow invaded or demonized or possessed by that being and sending it back to hell and freeing the person. And now, in this day and age, so the exorcisms are done over Skype. I'm going to reach out, cross the miles, and anoint you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The exorcist says this man, David, from Norway, is possessed by four demons. One of the demons, says Bob Larson, is sarcastic and mocking. Are you Bob the Builder? <laughs> you have mocked the servant of God. You will be, you will be struck with judgment for mocking the servant of God. Another demon, says Larson, is named Leviathan, who is dangerous and mean. Out of the way, Leviathan. Take you down, 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 down. You're not taking me anywhere. You're the I'm one who's going down. down. We will tear you apart bit by bit, and the dogs will eat your flesh. I 
call the hounds of hell to come now and begin to eat your flesh. To many, these exchanges could be seen as dramatic performances or conversations better suited between a psychiatrist and patient. Either way, it's hard not to be disturbed while watching. Say we break the curse. Say it, Leviathan. We will make the curse ten times worse. Judgment strikes you. Judgment strikes you. Kill everyone. It took over an hour, but the exorcist said he was successfully able to rid David of his demons for now. God bless. Bye-bye. Okay, Bye-bye. Before David says bye, we ask if we could have a few words with him. Do you think you'll be able to get rid of the demons that you believe are inside your body? I'm not sure if more are left, but time will show. And if there are, we'll, we'll, we will pluck them one by one. But with all due respect, some of what we just watched seemed like a very disturbing nightclub act. What's your response to that? It isn't. It's real. There would be no need to theatrically stage this for any reason. Why would anybody do that? I have no idea. Bob Larson says he has done more than 20,000 exorcisms, and he's certain there will never be any shortage of the devil's demons. But I sit here now in 2017 and start sniggering, which means that I have to accept you're perfectly entitled to snigger at me when I say that I light a candle and say the odd prayer, especially since I lost my father a few years ago. You're allowed to snigger at my religion. I mean, I'm this tell you what my most profound religious belief is if there is a god he can take being teased if, if if there is a god whether you call him yahweh or allah or or, or 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 jehovah or just god whatever you call him if he really is omniscient and omnipotent he can he can take a bit of teasing he can take a bit of mickey taking i'm pretty confident of that if he cre if he really did create the world i'm pretty sure he's going to be untroubled by a few cartoons or a monty python film but until i meet him I can't be sure any more than you can that I'm wrong. And yet, we find Satan funny. Western Christianity does, at least. And it is the imported different strands of Christianity that have brought exorcisms back into the mainstream. I think this is fascinating. I just think it is absolutely fascinating. Um, and again, you know, even if we are filing it at the moment under eccentric beliefs, it, it, it does demonstrate something else that highlights what we have in common rather than what sets us apart because in the islamic faith i've discovered since doing this job rather than calling them de demons the word is jinn with a d d j i n n i think it's the derivation of genie actually and that that again is the idea that a spirit can possess a human and, and make them do bad things so what's today's story about well it's about an astonishing rise that's the word used by the think tank that's published this report, an astonishing rise in, and here things get tricky, harmful Christian exorcisms. And of course that poses the question of what sort of exorcisms aren't harmful. But the report, which looks at the relationship between Christianity and mental health, concludes that exorcisms are now a booming industry. That's the phrase they use in the UK, with a number of interviewees noting the astonishing increase in demand. Um, it said that this industry, that's what they call it because people pay for the exorcism. Someone is offering themselves to provide a service and they expect to be paid for it almost, almost always. Um, it's driven by immigrant communities and Pentecostal churches which are very open about their exorcism services. And we can't really sneer at this in a, in a post-imperial Western way because it's in the New Testament. Christian country, Christian values. And yet I can't help, I don't know about you, but I'm already giggling on the inside until we hear how horrible some of these so-called ceremonies can be, and then they become anything but a laughing matter. So some of the people they spoke to include mental health chaplains, so clerics charged with responsibility for um, people battling mental health problems, people uh, dealing with mental health problems. They said that in the vast majority of cases, the person in question was suffering with mental health issues which required psychiatric assistance, and instead they get a blinking exorcism. And that brings us back to the Bible, because the, 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 the people sort of spouting gibberish that Jesus encountered and then cast out the demons, it's highly unlikely that they were possessed, in my view, by supernatural forces, and much, much more likely that they had a kind of 2,000-year-old um, version of, of what today we might call schizophrenia, 
or some other associated mental disorder. But can we do the what rather than the why to start with on this one? I just, I just want to know what you've come across in your world in the context of exorcisms. I've got nothing much. I've got one monk at my school 30 years ago who we all knew was the monastery exorcist. And there was a story that some years previously, some poor sod who'd been at the school, came back in the middle of the night and was clearly very, very unwell. And rather than calling a doctor, they because he went to the Abbey Church and, and all that, and instead of calling a doctor, they called the exorcist, which kind of plays into the story that's been reported today. And it would put, what, British Christianity, if you want to call it that, or Western Catholicism, about 45, 30 years, 20 years, 50 years, 50 years ahead of the Pentecostal brands of Christianity that have imported exorcism on and they describe it as an industrial scale. So just give me a call and talk me through it. 0345 973 You're not allowed um, to speak in too critical a way about other people's religious beliefs. Uh, if it were properly policed, then half of Twitter would be shut down with regard to the way people talk about Muslims today. Say what you like about Muslim terrorists, but the stuff people say about Muslims who don't have a, 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 a violent bone in their body is, is borderline illegal if the rules were properly enforced. And I don't know how you can explain to people, because I think this is bonkers, I'm not going to lie to you, but how do I explain to people or even tell people that I think it's bonkers without maligning their religious beliefs, without compromising their freedom of religion. It's a very good example of this, because it's not automatically up there with Charlie Hebdo cartoons or something like that, but it speaks to the same principle. Somebody believes something, why should I respect it? You, you don't have to respect what I believe. Why should I have to respect what you believe? And if your beliefs involve telling other people how they should and shouldn't lead their lives, I think you're dangerous. You believe whatever you want. You live your life according to whatever set of rules you desire. But the minute you start telling me what I can and can't wear, what I can and can't eat, the minute you start, in my humble opinion, for example, chopping off the foreskins of baby boys, I, I, I think religion becomes problematical when it imposes restrictions and rules on others that are not really free to choose. It's when you have problems, it all goes a bit handmade tale. So this is all, for me, part of the same universe. I could be wrong, but it seems to me that respecting the belief that you can exorcise a demon from another human being is wrong and dangerous, and yet it probably flies in the face of religious tolerance legislation. And it's nice to have this conversation because it's a Christian problem and also an Islamic problem, and presumably, I don't know about other religions, actually, whether or not... Um, they admit of the possibility of demonic possession, but we do. And it's, let's just say, strange. So give me a story. When have you come across this? I've got, I've got a, a second-hand story that's 30-odd years old, so you've got something more recent. And if you're part of one of these congregations, then explain to me why I shouldn't be worried, why I shouldn't describe it as bonkers. Explain to me why it is perfectly plausible. for uh, If you can believe in God, then you can believe in Satan, and if you can believe in uh, God's workers doing good, then you can believe in Satan workers doing ill. And uh, to suggest that, that, that laughing at that or mocking that is a natural response is profoundly offensive to you. 12 minutes after 12 is the time. You are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Kevin in Leicester, um, unfortunately, uh, unable to avail himself of the opportunity to talk to us. So we will reiterate the question. What is your experience of exorcisms? What is your... Ah, understanding of it because as I say mine is three and a half decades old and I don't have uh, an enormous amount of modern experiences to draw on so what happened and and how do we approach it how do we how do we tackle the issue in a way that um, recognizes that some people believe it but also recognizes that some of us should really be able to reserve the right to laugh at it to mock it or worse Mike's in South End on sea Mike what would you like to say Hello, James. Hello. Hello. I'm my radio off. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm a police officer and uh, I work in Essex. And um, I'm aware of a handful of times over the last 20 or 25 years while I've worked there where um, police have been called to incidents. And there's been no real proper explanation for what the officers have seen. And the only way that incident has been finalised is by the calling of a priest. Um, I, I, I've been to one such example in my entire career, Gosh. which was uh, in the 90s Go on. in Westcliff. And I was called in the middle of the night, and I was with my sergeant, and I was a rookie cop. And it was a house in Westcliff, and uh, this woman was in uh, a panic, a bit yeah. 
She showed us to a room, and in the room was a wooden table with a wooden chair on top of the table and another wooden chair balanced on two legs on top of the chair that was on top of the table. And, I mean, I've seen the stone balancing thing on beaches and whatnot, and, and I understand there might be some sort of scientific explanation, but yeah. on that night, there didn't appear to be. Um, that woman would have been an incredible actor and an incredible chair balance. So she, she, was, she was genuinely terrified, and as far as you could tell, something supernatural was, was occurring in the room. Absolutely. Good grief. And, and to stress again for anyone just tuning in, you're, you're a police officer. You're not, you're not a sort of ghostbuster or a, or yeah, no, <laughs> a paranormal no. investigator. James, I'm a police officer <laughs> and an atheist. Gosh. And, uh, and I like to think there's a scientific explanation for everything. But one thing that being in the police is, has taught me is sometimes there's an intangible reason for events and you just can't quite give an explanation to it. And I know a lot of cops listen to your show. And there'll be cops out there who will have similar experiences. And um, it's not widely reported. We don't publicise it. But sometimes the only way of dealing with an incident is to call a priest. Good grief. And what, can I ask what, what, what happened when the priest arrived? Uh, he, he gave a blessing and we all went home and it was a night shift. And uh, I pondered over it for a little while. But then I soon forgot about it because... I then went on to see all kinds of weird stuff, so you, you, it's just part of the rich tapestry of being a cop, really. <laughs> and you're still an atheist? I am still an atheist, yeah. So how did the chair end up on the table? I don't know. Chair <laughs> balancing? Who knows? But it's not the only one. No, I, I know, I know, I know. And it'd be quite an odd grounds for your conversion. It'd be quite an odd road to Damascus moment, wouldn't it? A sort of unwobbly chair making you suddenly hear the angels singing and, and, and sign up for a lifetime of devotion. Yeah, um, I, I'm aware, I, I know I've, I've got friends uh, in the force who, who, who've been to other similar incidents over the years. Yeah. Occasional hand, um, uh, books off shelves and CDs flying off shelves and things like that. They just simply can't explain. The, the household has explained it. They've turned up, seen a similar type of activity, and there's nothing else to do, is there? E even an atheist will call a priest uh, at moments like that. Oh, a great line. <laughs> 16 is the time, Mike. Thank you. You can grab Mike's phone line if you're quick on 0345 6060973. 16 is the time. It's among the stranger questions that uh, I've asked you over the years. Have you ever been to an exorcism? There has been, it is reported today, an astonishing rise in the number of harmful Christian exorcisms being driven by um, migrant communities and Pentecostal congregations. The, the, the reason why they're harmful is that most people qualified to comment uh, believe that an awful lot of people who receive this uh, so-called exorcism are in fact suffering from mental health issues and would be much better served with psychiatric assistance. And, th and that tallies with the gin phenomena, gin phenomenon, D-J-I-N-N, um, that we've spoken about on the programme in the past. Uh, this is a Christian um, phenomenon. The, the Muslim equivalent is almost identical, the idea that a cleric can somehow cast out evil spirits. It's just the name of the spirits that's different. Leanne's in Bishop Stortford. Leanne, what made you pick up the phone? Um, well, I have been to an exorcism. Um, unwittingly, I didn't realise that's what I was being taken to at the time. My Did, husband were you told it was a Tupperware? Were you told it was a Tupperware party? <laughs> Um, well, it was my brother-in-law, um, actually, oh. who, who took us. It was basically a coach trip up into the Italian mountains. Yeah. I thought we were just going to some small um, church. Yeah. Um, didn't really know what to expect. And it was uh, just a, basically a full-on um, exorcism um, with um, quite a lot of people. I'd probably say about 100 people there. Um, bringing people up, throwing hose water over them. Um, it was the most terrifying experience of my entire life. The bod people being bodily carried up, writhing, hissing, speaking in Arabic. God. Um, I, I mean, I thought, I didn't know what was going to happen to me when I had the holy water <laughs> thrown on me. Um, what were you, what, I mean, what was, were you, did your brother-in-law take you as spectators or, 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 or as participants? Um, he didn't think that you were um, possessed. No, well, I don't know, actually. <laughs> he did have a thing about me being... Um, a dirty Protestant, I think oh, really? is how he described me. Oh, Lord above. Um, but, um, yeah, he's very much into... His kind of beliefs are very much down that line that he believes in the devil okay. um, well. So uh, my husband's not along those lines. Um, but I mean, like, fun yeah, like so we really could say, a Christian fundamentalist, then? Yes, okay. I would say so, yes. Um, and when I came back, I mean, I have... 
have since converted to Catholicism, although my, my sort of whole religious beliefs are kind of swaying some sort of scientific... Um, no, of heart. course. I, I, we call yeah. it cognitive okay. dissonance. Welcome to the congregation. Yeah. Um, but the priest, uh, my priest, when I told him about it, he um, just said he thought it was an absolute load of rubbish. He was shocked. <laughs> I'm pretty sure my priest would as well, actually. It's it? anything like that. So, but... Um, yeah. What, 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 was it one person? Here. Was it one person that was on the receiving end of this and everybody else was in attendance? Or, or was it a sort of mess? No, 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 no. It was literally, I mean, there must have been a half a dozen people um, who, who came up in, in the whole event. Yeah. Um, and obviously some people were walking up normally as if nothing was going to happen. And all of a sudden as they got near this holy water that was going to be thrown on them with a jug. Yeah. Just all it, literally hissing, writhing. Oh, Lord. Um, um, having to be bo carried out by four or five men um, and then talking in some weird languages. I mean, I think Arabic was one of them. Well, although um, you're not qualified, you're not qualified to recognise Arabic. It could have just been a succession of of, of, of sounds exactly. or, or an approximation. Yeah, it, it so, what, what do you think? I mean, be rational for a moment. Actually, oh, you've been rational throughout this call. What, 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 a, what a rude observation for me to make. How, how, what do you think was going on? Do you think they were poorly, or do you think that they were con artists, or...? Um, part of me thinks they were con artists. Right. At the time, I didn't know what to think, because you get sucked into the whole thing. Of There's course. incense. Like, the whole area is filled with um, I don't know, incense, and it, it's very heady, the whole atmosphere. Um, but my looking back, I think... The priest seemed to enjoy the entire thing. The one that was um, performing the exorcism, he thought it, he, I could, he was sort of laughing about it as he was carrying it out. But, but my honest opinion is now, I just think the whole thing was a huge con. Yes. Um, yeah. Well, I just wonder because I mean, obviously, some people who have been exposed to it are poorly and should be getting help with, with with mental health issues. But what you described sounded so theatrical. I just wondered whether it was some form of staged tourist attraction. This is what I honestly think, and so it would worry me, honestly, if that sort of if these things are, are coming are becoming more frequent here, because I do think there's a lot of theatrics to it. Yes, and, and it imbues the clerics with with undeserved power, as all of these things do. Uh, you know, the, the the idea that you exercise power over a group of people by dint of your your sort of supernatural status it, it's 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 another thing that many of us who go to church sort of struggle with. Although for me, the benefits massively outweigh the the, the struggles. Twenty five minutes after twelve is the time. Leanne, thank you. You see, you, you get on better with your brother in law now. Um, next question. <laughs> John's in the Isle of Dogs. John, what would you like to say? Hello, James. Hi. I've been told not to be too specific with names and and things like that, so I'll try and keep it, you know, so I okay. specific. Well, yeah. Um, it took place on the Isle of Dogs in a in a block of flats, a council block of flats. Can I name the flats? Why would well. you want, Why would you want to? Just out of interest. No, because, uh, maybe because there's other people that live on the Isle of Dogs. Yeah, it was a tight... But if, 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 look, I, yeah, I trust Caroline with my life. If she's asked you to keep details out of the conversation, let's okay, just keep details right. out of the conversation. Is that all right, mate? Yeah, that's fine. Nice yeah, that's one. Fine. Go on. Uh, what happened was there was something going on in this block of flats that caused people to enter into mass hysteria, which they thought. My sister's friends lived in this block of flats, and uh, their two kids were... Uh, eyes were rolled in, things were going wrong in the flats. How long ago is this? Uh, I was about, I'm um, approaching 60, and I was probably in my late teens. When okay. This it's documented. It, it was reported in East London Advertiser. Oh, all right. You can actually go online and all see right. it if you want to. And, and, and how many children were affected? I mean, was it, was it lots well, the of... Old, the, old, the, old block of <laughs> the old block of flats basically decanted and ran across to the church opposite. I won't name the church opposite, but there's only one church on the <laughs> you other just side. You're making me so bloody cryptic, it does. Just tell me the well, story. <laughs> okay, well, the, the church is the, uh, Christ Church opposite, and the block of flats is opposite Christ Church, yeah? So, um, say it was taking place, the black mass, I don't know what it was, but there was, you know, there was eruptions going on, everyone decanted from the flats, and... Um, then what transpired from there is that I'm, I'm Catholic, I'm not a practicing Catholic, but I went to a Catholic school and yeah. it was a diocese and we had a canon. A diocese was a canon. I won't mention his name because I've been asked to, but that canon <laughs> performed the exorcism down at this block of flats on the Isle of Dogs. And did everything, everything was all right after that? Yeah, there was mass hysteria. The old, the old what do you think then? What church. do you think it was? 
Well, I, I, I don't know, but none of the people was connect, interconnected with it. They were all in their separate houses doing what they could not Couldn't it have been something chemical? Like, could it have been something chemical in the atmosphere? Something coming through the air vents? Something in the paint or something like that, no? It could have been, but it could also have been something spiritual. Yeah, I mean, you don't know. I don't know the occult. I don't know what it's all about. But, you know, and also, I understand my, my family was quite a religious family, Catholic-wise, that the exorcist, exorcism mass can only be performed by a high-ranking uh, priests, such as a canon and above. It can't be performed by any just normal cleric. No, that's absolutely right. That's why when I was a, a, a lad, the monastery attached to my school, it was a specific monk who had that role. Okay, on a scale of one to ten, how spooky is this? I was just googling a bit while you were talking, and a story that came up was the Catholic priest who inspired the Exorcist. This is published in the Daily Mail. Um, died from a fall after a possessed child spoke to him, and he was pushed over by an invisible force, according to claims from a former CIA agent called Robert Marrow. Okay, that was published. That was published. This year, on my birthday, okay. on my birthday. Mm. But this this uh, priest of ours that was the guy. Where, where's the sound effect? Uh, blah, 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 you know, whatever it is. I don't know. I don't know. It's true. Do you think that it's true? You know what I mean? I don't, I don't know, but it's clearly made an impression on you 30 years later. It's still very fresh in your memory, and I can see why. I, I don't know that we couldn't necessarily have heard a few more details. I think we're more worried about children who might be listening being, being, being upset or, 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 or spooked by some of the detail. I don't think geography particularly matters, but that, that, yeah, that's not an uncommon story. My phone lines are full. Make of that what you will. Um, 0345 973 is the number you need if you want to grab the one that John has just vacated. We've only got 15 minutes of this left because PMQs has been on while we've been talking about demonic possession. You can insert your own punchline there. And uh, we'll be finding out what's gone on at PMQs at about 12.45. So there's room for a couple more calls before that. The time now is half past 12. Exorcisms on the rise. Uh, do not adjust your radios. It's true. And it's unremarkable in a lot of corners of the country. I can tell by the people ringing me. And I will talk to as many of them as possible between now and 12.45. Unless, of course, Chris in Woking is possessed of stories so utterly, utterly remarkable that we stay with him for the duration. I reserve the right to do that as well. Chris is in Woking. Chris, what can you tell us? Hi, James. Hi. Yeah, I'm, I'm a vicar um, in a parish just uh, south of Woking. Uh, I've been in the job for about 10 years or so. Hmm. Um, what I would say is that the, the Church of England has a whole range of sort of prayers and blessings for many different situations, some which are the sorts of things we've been talking about, and some are light and simple things. So, for instance, I offer when somebody moves into a home, would you like me to come round and bless yeah. your home? You know, which is a, just a sort of a nice thing. It's not suggestive of anything nasty there. It's it's just getting yeah, a bit yeah. of goodness in the place, a good start. Mm. Um, but then that goes all the way through to some of the things that your that people have been phoning in have been have been mentioning. Uh, the Church of England does have specialist deliverance ministry, they call it. Um, and on two occasions in my time as a vicar, I've had to sort of call in the deliverance ministry um, because it's been something that I personally either didn't understand or couldn't deal with really so it's quite it's this is unusual i i've found oh, this is going to sound like a like a mickey taking question but i promise you it's not is, is, is there a special phone number um well i mean i've got the sort of the uh, uh you know, the phone list here for the, yeah. the diocese in which i work and yes i know who it is and, Good grief. and every church of england diocese will have at least one who is who is sort of set aside for this kind of work, and I think some of your other callers have mentioned it, you know. Yes, yes. Senior canons and this, this type of thing. And it's not something that your average priest would normally get involved with once it gets beyond a certain, a certain level. Um, but I think what one of your callers previously said about there being a sort of a, a psychological overlap, and that's certainly been what I've found um, in the past as well. Yes, so, so people are poorly more likely than... Yeah. I mean, do you believe in possession? Um, yes, I think somebody can be possessed of something either they generate within themselves, thinking that there's something that's not of them. Um, or, indeed, yes, I do feel, you know, I, uh, I believe in the Almighty, etc. And, you know... Yeah. It, you can, can, do you, so your faith, your position would be that you can't really do one without the other if you believe in... Yes. Un, 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 I mean, uncontained benevolence, as, as, yes. as God represents. You also have to believe in, in infinite evil. Yes, most definitely do. Gosh. Um, although I see a lot less of the evil side than I do of the God side, which probably doesn't surprise you. Let's have a look at my inbox. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's... Uh, it, over the years, as I say, it's not been something which has been hugely, hugely prevalent, but where it has come up, 
it's often been something that it's sort of grown inside a person. They've become worried about things, you know, they're, and, and they're that, seeing all yeah. over the place inside the house or in their lives. Yes. You know, evidence that they may be generating within themselves that's but, just constantly worrying them. Yeah, but that, I mean, that's almost a textbook definition of an anxiety disorder, isn't it? Or of, of, of a form of, you know, yeah. uh, uh, mental mental illness. Gosh. And, and what we're talking here is... The uh, problem is now you lead me into quite choppy waters, Father Chris, because... Because I, I, I was about to make a kind of value judgment there based on on a kind of geographical origin. So you speak in quite a matter-of-fact way and acknowledge that it will be mostly issues that ultimately can be attributed to mental health. In the short term, of course, if having a, having a del deliverance minister in the house helps that person in, in pain feel better, it's a good thing to do. But what this story today focuses on, the, the, the uh, Pentecostal and, and Christian congregations that have been imported from elsewhere, is, is, is a little uglier, isn't it? The idea that a young person in particular who's being disobedient to their parents and displaying traditional rebellious streaks, I've heard stories in the past of them being subjected to some form of exorcism as if their independence of thought is proof of possession. Yes, yes. And you only have to go back into the history of the Church of England and you'll find exactly the same thing. Not to suggest that some, the Church of England has somehow moved on, but... Um, you know, the whole idea of, of, of burying a suicide at a crossroads and giving them no funeral and type things like this, um, where there has been some idea of possession or something that's gone wrong that we, you know, we can't deal with in the normal sort of way. It needs to be set aside or sort of in some way addressed with something that's very different from what we normally do. Yeah, crikey. Uh, you, 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 you sound like a good vicar, if you'd allow me to say that. It's a slightly <laughs> odd thing to say, but but it's, it's, it's the more matter-of-fact and down-to-earth um, religious ministers are, the less the less likely we are to find ourselves in in a sort of mess that history often delivers. Jeanette is in Southwark. Jeanette, what would you like to say? Oh, hi. Yeah, oh, thanks for taking the call. Um, I had to call in um, because I'm just concerned that some people might... Um lose the opportunity if they do need deliverance. I used to be a deliverance minister um, many moons ago. No, because it, it does... Well, well within the Anglican it. Church, within the Church of England? No, as a born-again Christian, we we don't call it exorcism. Um, it's more of a deliverance. But the thing so is... I would I play the Ray Liotta clip at this point in proceedings normally, but I sense that, that, that we're, we're dealing with matters too too grave and important to, 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 to play a comedy clip. From, exactly, exactly. Yes. I think it's, it's similar to, like, you know discussions about se um, sexual abuse like 10, 20 years ago considered taboo. Um, you know, we need to talk about it and you're doing absolutely the right thing, but people also need to have an open mind because there are over 7 billion people on this earth. We all have different walks in life. We all have different experiences and backgrounds. And for some people, it's appropriate. I called in because it is absolutely appropriate if the source of the problem is considered to be spiritual or... Oh, well, well, I mean, what, well, forgive me, I'm, I, well, what are your qualifications to... to okay. For qualifications, well, um, I did actually quali well qualifications. I was a born again um, Christian. I'm actually a doctor now. Um, a medical I study doctor. People, yeah, a surgical doctor. Um, I have. And you still believe in possession? Well, do you know, as I said, everything has its place, and you know, you can't just poo bar other people's experience. I deal with everyone. Well, I, in I mean, I, I, I can and I do, but possibly I shouldn't. I just, I just asked you a fairly straightforward question. I, as, do, as, I do in certain circumstances, but the thing is, is to use wisdom and not to, um, because yes, a lot of things that people have said are all true. There are people who are charlatans. There are people who put it on. There are lots of people who don't understand it. But as I said, going to subjects of taboo that are uh, like sexual orientation, sexual... There was a time when everybody just said, oh, well, if you're a particular colour, then you must be completely wrong. We need to be open-minded, because you don't no, know... I'm, 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 no, I'm... No, there's a skin... Skin, skin colour and eccentric beliefs should not be conflated. It well, is, it does. Or indeed, sexuality and eccentric beliefs should be... Well, I mean, you're... Some, absolutely, it does, because... Right, how can you possibly know what I'm about to say? No, no. Oh, sorry. Only, I'm only only because I know you only have a short amount of time, and, and this this show, I love this show, but so many people are listening, and I just don't want everyone to shut down because in the right circumstances, it's appropriate. It's what concerns me is when there are lots of times when it's not appropriate. Yeah, okay, I get all of that, but what, what concerns me is that you have no qualifications whatsoever to determine what's appropriate and what isn't. 
Yeah, but then who has qualifications for anything to talk about anything, well, really? You, you're a doctor I mean, and you just asked me that question. No, 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 but it's... But it's so you, 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 don't think, you don't think that your medical exams and your medical training makes you a, a more suitable person to conduct surgery than someone who's had no training yeah, or qualifications? It, it makes me more suitable to give my opinion, but even if you've got a group of doctors, like, a, you know, oh, even okay. five or ten doctors, we all have different opinions. It just means that we're educated to give a better opinion. But when you're coming... We're not talking about medical world. We're talking... About but we are, though. That's the point, isn't it? These people well, need psychiatric are, help. Well, I... Yes, that's why I'm saying... That's medicine. So if it's not... If it's somebody... If the Psychiatry is problem, medicine. Psychiatry no, is a no, branch no, no, of no. medicine. Hold on, hold on. If the problem is a psychiatric problem, then it's not appropriate to go down the route of deliverance, which is why I'm saying to you... Yes. It is, but if the problem... Is so give me a description of a, of a problem that's not psychiatric but is demonic possession. Right. There are lots of people in the world who actually do um, dabble in occultism. Every culture has it. And if any culture says they don't have it, then they're lying. Every nation upon this earth has some religion that dabbles it's in not, not, not what I, I'm going to run out of time and I want to squeeze oh. in Peter, but just, just once again, so, 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 an example of something that you can be confident is not a psychiatric disorder but is evidence of demonic possession. Well, there, as I said, you know, people who in, they have dabbled with um, Ouija boards, etc., and had like supernatural things that happened afterwards, they were completely fine before they did some kind... There are lots of practices that people, you know, especially young kids get okay. involved in. I just, I'm just going to squeeze Peter in before the travel news. Peter's in Vauxhall. Peter, what would you like to say? Hi, James. What's that call? I obviously want to... Oh, my God, he's speaking in tongues. You've gone all echoey. The voice, it sounds, it sounds, it sounds as if you're in an enormous cathedral. <laughs> right. No, I was in the unit. Now I'm That's out. better. Right. That's better. Uh, what do you want to tell me, Peter? Let, let, uh, let me tell you my, uh, my story. I mean, my, my devil for me speaking right now. So what happened? Uh, last year, I found out that I'm going to be a dad. Yes. I left my job because it was very stressful, and um, I had a flashback. I seen my girlfriend's head when I was cooking in, uh, in the frying pan. And I called my priest, and he said that I have the devil in me. And one word switched everything in my life. Uh, I was so scared of, of waking up in the morning. I was, uh, I've been as well in Romania in, on the churches, and uh, they've done plenty of prayers on me to, to remove the devil inside of me. But at that time, I had no idea that I have a period CD. I was you about to say, that sounds disorder. like obsessive compulsive disorder or some form exactly. of anxiety exactly. disorder. Yeah, yeah, or she did it was, but they, the, the priest themselves, they didn't want it to admit that. Was this so, back in Romania? The priest was in Romania. Yeah, that's right, that's right. But they didn't want to admit that I have, uh, because, you know, as a priest, uh, OCD, you don't want to show OCD. Maybe as a devil, you, you're, going, you're not going to tell uh, uh, you have OCD because you have obsessive compulsive disorder. No, you have a small devil inside you, and that word trigger everything on uh, switch switch my life believe me i was crying i was oh, no. I, I was in my life yeah i was about to end my life yeah yeah but what happened uh, i divorced god i was i was really a religious man i was yes. i was coming from a background of a uh, religious family like sunday and uh, now i divorced god i feel unbelievable better with and, 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 and you've had treatment for your ocd yeah, and uh, I'm starting to become a counselor as well on OCD, on pure OCD. So it's, it's, it's unbelievable. I mean, one bad thing changed my life in better. Oh, that's a re remarkable story. I'm so glad we found the time to squeeze you in at the end, and, I, and I'm glad you're in such a, such a better place. I, I, I mean, I'm not here to advise anybody or, or, or counsel anybody, but I don't, I mean, you know, some of the benefits that you drew from your faith are uh, not necessarily ones that you need to abandon forever, but it certainly sounds like in the short term that, that you've had a... Quite a lucky escape, actually, Peter. If you've got a priest actually telling you that you're possessed by a devil, I can see why that might... It's an understatement of the century incoming. I can see why that might turn your head a bit. It's 12.46. My apologies to everybody else who wanted to, to talk about exorcisms. We, we may return to it on, a, on another day, although... Well, we will return to it on another day, although I struggle. I, I mean, hands up when I can't quite see clearly. I, I struggle to walk the tightrope between finding it slightly funny and recognising what a serious subject it is for a variety of reasons. Um, but that, that, that's my bad. Nobody's perfect. Well, I say that. Vincent McAvinney is here to talk us through events at PMQs. It's a, it's a, a, a cavalcade of perfection. Per perfect leader of the opposition, perfect prime minister, and a perfect correspondent for us. Vinny, what happened? Oh, we'll see. You've bigged me up now there. Let's see. I'm only standing in a room for Theo. <laughs> well, it was PMQs. The prime minister and Jeremy Corbyn uh, finished a little while ago. I think it was a 
steady performance from the Prime Minister, but a confident one from Jeremy Corbyn. He's definitely looking a lot more relaxed in his role as the leader of the opposition, and he's also much more focused than he was before the election. Today was all about pay and the NHS and public sector workers. Now, the build-up to this has been, there has been a split in the Cabinet on the cap of 1% pay rises for public sector workers, and we've seen some members of the Cabinet breaking ranks over the past few days, notably Michael Gove on uh, Sunday saying that he thought the cap should be reconsidered and Boris Johnson seemingly signalling the same. Now, Theresa May doesn't want to do this and Philip Hammond, who's wanting to write his own budget later in the autumn, very much against this. Here's Jeremy Corbyn trying to highlight that divide in the Cabinet. Mr Speaker, after a week of flip-flopping and floundering, we thought we got some clarity from Downing Street at last. On Monday, the announcement was that the public sector pay cap at 1% remains, and a rare moment of agreement between number 10 and 11 was seen. But yesterday, we had news that firefighters are going to be offered 2% this year and 3% next year. So can the Prime Minister confirm whether the public sector pay cap will remain for all other public servants until 2020. Now, the pickle that the Prime Minister and the Chancellor have got themselves in is some of the pay review bodies that look at pay and determine what should uh, the rise be have already reported this year. So the nursing one, the doctor's one, for instance, the NHS mm. ones, have already reported and they've accepted those reports. Now, whether or not the, the Chancellor in the autumn statement can go back and change that is unclear. This week, the Prime Minister's official spokesperson on this issue hasn't sort of said whether or not that's possible or not. But there are some that are still coming down the line, like teachers, and as Jeremy Corbyn there mentioned, firefighters who don't actually have a pay review body. So the Prime Minister now very carefully not really confirming what her plans are so that Philip Hammond has maximum manoeuvrability on this issue. There are outstanding pay review body reports. Those cover teachers, prison officers, police officers and senior salaries. And the government will consider those reports very carefully and will respond to them. But while we do that, we will always recognise the need to ensure that we take those decisions against the need to live within our means. The, the right honourable gentleman and I both value public sector workers and our public services. The difference is, I know we have to pay for them. Now, Jeremy Corbyn hammered on with this message. He had a letter from a teacher called David talking about how the education services are only just running on the goodwill of teachers, but it's coming to an end. And he really went in on this point on all of his questions. But the Prime Minister reverted to that tactic that she used pre-election of bringing it always back to the economy, saying you can't have any of this without economic management and I'm the only person who can do that. And it isn't fair to go out and tell people that they can have all the public spending they want without paying for it. Yes. Labour's way leads to fewer jobs, higher prices, uh, more taxes, and Labour's way means everyone pays the price of Labour. But Jeremy Corbyn had a good response to that this time. In the election, we heard multiple times there wasn't a magic money tree. And Theresa May there emphasising it's about bringing down the deficit, managing the economy. But Jeremy Corbyn had this retort for her. Well, the Prime Minister found £1 billion to keep her own job. Why can't she find the same amount of money to keep nurses and teachers in their job, who, after all, serve all of us? Now, I would say here, she will know that that was coming, so I'll be interested to hear her response, because this will probably be the most rehearsed response of PMQs. And I've got that clip ready for you. Now, the <laughs> Prime Minister is slightly worried about this rattling of Jeremy Corbyn being viewed as possible a prime minister in waiting it's you know undoubted many people do say he has tapped into something in the country a feeling that we saw in the election that something was going wrong and in fairness and that it's something that he understands more than she may be able to and so she went in on that attack i know that the right honorable gentleman has taken to calling himself a government in waiting well we all what that means. Waiting to put up taxes, waiting to destroy jobs, waiting to bankrupt our country. We will never let it happen. 
So it wasn't an ace, to borrow some Wimbledon terminology, but uh, it was a solid return from the Prime Minister. Now, Labour is convinced that there will be another election this year. They are keeping are themselves. You sure? are you, are they, they do yeah. seem to be on that footing. John McDonnell is, uh, we think, behind the scenes telling everyone to keep prepared, to stay on that footing, to be a Prime Minister in waiting. And for Jeremy Corbyn today, it was a, a confident performance. The Prime Minister had a steady response. It was somewhat of a stalemate today, but he did show that he can, when he can take an issue like this pay and NHS, you know, it, he highlighted the fact it was the 69th birthday of the NHS and the Prime Minister wasn't giving it much of a present with depleted numbers, uh, but he sort of hammered away with a steady focus today and uh, I think he will be pretty happy with how he did. Yes, he looks that way. I mean, I, I kind of see his role as easier than it was before the election in a way because he's got credibility now which he didn't have before he's got a degree of unity on his own benches and oddly the the the, the winner of the general election is important to remember who won the winner of the general election enjoys none of that the, the cre credibility is is arguably diminished and unity on her benches is almost non-existent. So he does have a form of momentum behind him, but it's about sustaining that. He's going to have to keep this level of focus that he showed today to really hammer an issue away that, you know, he spotted tactically that there is a split there between the cabinet and that he needs to go at it. That line about, you know, a sort of, you know, rare moment of, uh, of uh, a, you know, of similarity a between number between 10, 10 and 11, and 11 and um, is something that he knows that he needs to exploit, that this is a government now that is unable to govern because it can't decide what it's trying to do and they're all trying to still rattle as to who may be a possible next leader. Indeed, and, and no one seems to fancy it. Surprisingly not. Which is the strangest thing of all. Many thanks. Uh, David Davis, according to the latest uh, research into Conservative Party membership, is the favourite to replace Theresa May, which um, I don't know what that says or what that, what, what, what that demonstrates, but I thought I'd share it with you nonetheless. Vincent, that was brilliant. That, that's not the first time you've done it, is it? I think it is. Is that really? It's effortless. Seamless. Theo Oshwood will be, will be worried, he'll be very, very worried sitting <laughs> at home. I don't think he's got anything to worry sipping about. Sipping his pina colada, listening to the radio. <laughs> Great stuff. Thank you very much, Vincent McAvinney. You can, of course, hear the whole programme back if you subscribe to the podcast service at LLBC. And um, uh, the, the analysis of PMQ seems, I think, to be um, at one with the overviews uh, published elsewhere. That Corbyn has a much easier job now than he had before the election. Whether or not we're going to see a general election before Christmas. I'm personally not so sure. I, I, I mean, I, it should be the worst ever value. One billion pound purchase, wouldn't it? Ten DUP votes for one billion quid, and then it turns out she only wants them or gets them for three or four months. So it spoke to me, that deal with the DUP, of a determination to hang in there. Uh, although Vincent's quite right when he talks about the war footing that the Labour Party are on, there are some surprisingly vulnerable Conservative seats that um, Labour activists are, are targeting, or are actually doorstepping and leafleting at, at weekends. But stranger, stranger things are happening. It's just turning 12.59. You are listening to James O'Brien. This is LBC. We'll do it all again tomorrow morning from 10. I am doing this time.